Wow, what an audience. Do I get to say welcome to Miami or only well, you? <laughs> no, you can say it. Go ahead. We are so incredibly excited, as Richard said, to be here. Thank you all for joining us. I have the privilege of welcoming two very distinguished guests here to the stage. And even though you need no introduction, I'll say a few things to get us going. Today we really are gathering to talk about challenges. And I think when you first talked to Richard about hosting FII in Miami, we couldn't have imagined some of the global market disruption that we're seeing, and certainly so many of the national security and geopolitical issues we're facing. So to have the chance to open this up, this whole summit, with two leaders that have been in the throes before of challenges. The first is His Excellency Yasser al Ramayan. He's, of course, the governor of the Public Investment Fund of Saudi Arabia, chairman of the FII Institute, and chairman of Saudi Aramco. I've had the privilege of working with His Excellency for many, many years. We're also privileged to have the first locally born mayor of Miami, Mayor Suarez, who likes to maybe refer to the city a little bit, the magic of Miami, and we'll get into why that is. Mayor Suarez has watched as Miami's economy has increased and has focused on so many policies that have championed economic reform and opportunity throughout the city. Both of our panelists have had a tremendous vision for both their cities and, their, this, and the country, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So Mr. Mayor, I'm going to start with you. Thank you. I have to say seeing Jeff Plow and a few other New Yorkers we're a little envious of all that you're doing in Miami. You should be. <laughs> Everybody wants to move to Miami. You've really prioritized focusing on new sectors, fintech, medtech, and really focused on entrepreneurship. Yep. So what's the secret sauce? You know, the secret sauce is actually quite simple. And first, uh, I want to thank His Excellency, um, Her Royal Highness, uh, people like Jared, who are new Miamians and have been a big part of me coming to uh, Saudi and being uh, John as well, um, uh, inviting me over to, to the Riyadh office of our firm. The, the formula for Miami is simple for success. We keep taxes low, we keep people safe, and we lean into innovation. Shocking, right? <laughs> We've lowered taxes to the lowest level ever, and we had 12% growth, the second most in recorded history. We never got into the nonsense that other cities got into with defunding their police. We increased funding for police. We gave them the technology they needed to do their job. We supported them. And they have the hardest job in America, by the way, right now. Um, they're constantly under attack and under tremendous scrutiny for very little pay. And shocking correlation. We increased budgets for them, and crime went down. We had the lowest per capita homicide rate since 1964. Wow. Okay. It was safer to be a Miami in per capita last year than any year between now and 1964. If you remember 1980 in Miami, we had 220 homicides. We were one of the murder capitals of America. That's an 80% drop. This year, we're 30% below last year's record. And the third thing is we lean into innovation. We've created one of the most dynamic economies in the country, if not the world. Um, we've moved about two and a half trillion assets under managed companies to Miami in the last 24 months increased our venture capital pipeline by about 500%. And uh, when you juxtapose it in terms of trend, we just had the biggest deal flow year ever with about $5.8 billion worth of deals. It's an 11.6% increase. And New York, not to pick on New York, lost 15% of its deal flow. And other cities lost 25 to 40. So I think our trajectory is up while many others are suffering. And what are you concerned about, though, in terms of challenges that could stunt some of that growth with some of the economic conditions you're seeing? Well, mayors never sleep. You know, it's, it's not in our nature. Uh, obviously, we want to make sure that our educational system is on par with that growth. We want to make sure that climatic events like hurricanes and things like that don't disrupt our economy. Uh, we want to make sure that transportation infrastructure is in place for the growth that we're inevitably, inevitably going to see. We have 30,000 residential units in the two-year pipeline, so we're gonna grow by 18% physically over the next two years. Um, and so, you know, those are the big challenges, of course. Uh, affordable housing is another major challenge for urban America, not just for Miami. So those are the major, uh, you know, challenges that I focus on. You know, it's interesting, Your Excellency, as I hear the mayor describe both the challenges that he faced and continues to face, but also the opportunities. Many of the areas of focus are very reminiscent of Vision 2030 and many of the things that you have invested in over these many years since the launch of the Blueprint. So there's some parallels, aren't there, of Miami and the work that you're doing in the kingdom? 
Um, totally agree. I mean, um, what Miami did um, is amazing. I mean, to grow a city from um, really um, horrible numbers and homicide and many other things to uh, become one of the safest places to grow the uh, ecosystem and the infrastructure. And I think that's exactly what happened uh, in Saudi with the, uh, with the birth of the Vision 2030. So Vision 2030 um, started with um, a full diagnostic about the, um, uh, uh, the, the Saudi economy um, and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. After that, um, we looked at the um, uh, benchmarks uh, that we have globally. Um, and then we came to um, materialization of the things that we would like to achieve, and we put it in numbers and targets and uh, key performance indicators. And then uh, after that, we put the, um, the action plan, how we're going to achieve it, execute uh, uh, all of this uh, put together. And the numbers are from uh, the date that it started, 2017, all the way up to 2030. Um, some of these um, processes took us really a long time in planning. The execution started, and uh, in some aspects, the, uh, we have achieved the numbers like in 2020, which is 10 years before uh, the, um, uh, the actual targets. I'll give an example. Uh, woman uh, in work. Um, the, um, I think the, uh, the percentage of women working in Saudi Arabia was um, something like 16%, and our target was about uh, 30%. We have achieved 37% by the year 2020, which is... Uh, <laughs> which is which is something that we were really excited about. Uh, you know, the engagement of uh, women, the workplace, the ecosystem, the, the, the whole thing. And if you look at the uh, Saudi economy, uh, it's a thriving economy. And um, uh, I think uh, the IMF was expecting that we will be growing uh, in 2022 by um, seven and a half percent on the GDP, we have achieved 8.7 percent, making us the fastest growing GDP uh, in the G20 countries. Um, we looked at the uh, unemployment. Um, we lowered the numbers from um, about uh, 12 and a half uh, in uh, 2016. Now we are below nine uh, percent. Um, it's not only the, um, uh, the employment uh, numbers, it's the quality of these numbers, and that's something very, very important. So it's not only the jobs that we are creating, but how good are these jobs? Mm -hmm. Because uh, that, that's one of the main things that, um, uh, you know, the economic numbers doesn't show you. It shows only the top-line numbers without digging into the quality of uh, these numbers. And I think we've, we've done all of this because of many things. First, the great leadership that we have uh, through King Salman and the Crown Prince. Um, we put the Vision uh, 2030 very well planned, very challenging, but yet achieved, uh, achieving uh, targets. And we got uh, the right people working uh, around it. So you have the political will, you have the right processes, and you have the right people. Mm -hmm. And that's what made it uh, work so well so far, and hopefully we will achieve all of our targets by the year 2030. Well, you're always very focused on measuring those targets, and I thought it was interesting, as Richard was describing the new index and the things that you're going to follow. Um, tell us a little bit about how that's tracking really from a PIF perspective, the kinds of sectors you're interested in investing in, the kinds of things over the next few years that you're really focused on? Because I think you've actually taken um, a little bit more of a vision towards what's happening in the world, investing in renewable, electric, some of these other things, really from a PIF perspective as well. Yeah, uh, PIF is the main uh, economic engine of Saudi Arabia. We have... Um disclosed our first vision realization uh, program document back in 2017 
all the way up to the end of uh, 2020. We put all of our targets, all of our numbers, what kind of jobs we want to create, number of jobs, number of um, sectors, and we achieved uh, all of these numbers. The second document that we've issued was at the beginning of 2021, and it's going to take us um, all the way to the end of 2025. I'll just give some context. PIF, when um, uh, the Crown Prince became the chairman back in 2015, we had $150 billion assets under management. Today, we're around $650 billion, and our target by the end of 2025, we want to go to $1 trillion. Um, by the um, end of 2030, we're hoping to be somewhere between 2 to $3 trillion. We have 13 different sectors that we're interested uh, in. We have established so far about 71 companies. We've created uh, more than half a million uh, jobs, and we want to create 1 million jobs, additional 1 million jobs by the end of uh, 2025, both direct and uh, indirect. So uh, we, the uh, PIF is becoming the enabler. Mm -hmm. for achieving uh, the main KPIs of uh, the Vision 2030. So the country said by the year 2060, we want to, be, to have zero uh, emission. PIF came and said by the year 2050, we want to have uh, uh, carbon neutrality. And to do so, we started um, investing in... Um, uh, renewables and uh, green hydrogen. In fact, we are the uh, largest investor in the world today in both renewable and, uh, and uh, green hydrogen. Saudi Arabia wants to have about 50% of its power generation through renewable. So that's a big mandate. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we, we uh, went to companies like Aqua Power, which is one of our national champions. We now own about 40% of that company. And we have a mandate to create about 75% of all the renewable energy uh, in, Saudi, uh, in Saudi Arabia. And these are really big numbers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, uh, you hear a lot of, of, about the numbers and aspirations worldwide. But we started executing these uh, projects. Green hydrogen, I'll give an example. The largest uh, project in the world today is in Saudi Arabia. It's um, a venture between Neom, um, uh, Air Products, and Aqua Power, about uh, five and a half uh, billion uh, dollars, and it's going to make us the largest uh, green hydrogen producer. Uh, in the world, Aramco, and I'm going to be talking about Aramco uh, uh, maybe afterward, they have a lot of uh, great initiatives. If you put all of these uh, things together, we are um, result-oriented, we have the political will, and we want to achieve uh, what we are saying. And last question before I ask the mayor is a similar one. You're also, um, you have a few hats, um, as we say, chairman of Aramco. Yeah. And I do think one of the most is interesting things is how many years ago Aramco started to think about moving forward on clean energy. And I don't think that story is as understood. You know, today people are a little, a little bit worried that the energy disruption caused by the war in Ukraine may take the, the green, the focus on green and climate transition a few steps back. And we do have to be realistic today that obviously um, not, it, energy and national security are remarkably intertwined and each country has to think about protecting their energy sources in a way that I think we may have missed along the way a bit as we were trying to pursue a great goal in climate transition. But you've really embedded that a bit in the business strategy at Aramco. Correct. Aramco is the world's largest company uh, when it comes to both the revenue and the bottom line. We just announced uh, the 2022 uh, net profit was $161 billion. We have $148 billion of free cash flows. And we don't consider ourselves as a utility company. We want to grow the company. Currently, um, it's uh, one of the largest, if not the largest company in the world. 
and I'm not talking about oil and gas, I'm talking generally, we want to grow this company even further by going to not only to the oil and gas. And by the way, oil and gas and fossil fuel is not such a bad thing. And I can talk for days about why we should really invest in exploration and we should have long term views um, and um, not only, you know, going by a certain ideal or um, uh, an ideology and not thinking about the consequences of that. Aramco today is the lowest emitting oil and gas company in the world, by far. So I'll just give an example, and I gave this example many, many times. The barrel of oil that we produce in Aramco emits 10 and a half kilograms of carbon dioxide versus the industry average is about 25 kilograms. If you take us out of the industry average, the industry average will go to about 27, 28 kilograms. We are one third of the uh, rest of the uh, industry. So that's, that's one, uh, one thing that we're working on, how to reduce the emission. Then um, uh, the next thing, of course, that's in scope one and two, which is the actual um, uh, extraction of the oil and the, uh, uh, the, the uh, tra uh, uh, transition in the uh, oil from the oil fields to uh, the plants and uh, other things. Then you have scope three, which is the actual uh, usage of uh, our products. And this is something even in Aramco we're working on, how to reduce the emission from the internal combustion engines and the cars by about 30%, how to expand the range by another 30%. So if you put all of these things together mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you start um, assessing them and look at the numbers, it makes really a better sense than what the world is trying to do. The, um, uh, some of the governments around the world bullied the oil and gas companies um, because of their emission, and instead of looking at the problem and try to fix it, they just wanted to stop it. Now, what happened after that? It started with the oil crisis because you have less exploration, you have less supply, and the demand is increasing because we wanted to change to renewable. And I understand that. We are the largest in the renewable. However, it takes time, longer time, to ha have a full uh, transition from the fossil fuel to the um, renewable. I'll give some numbers in here. The world needs about um, 200 plus trillion dollars of investments in renewable energy from today until the end of 2050 uh, uh, to have the uh, carbon neutrality. How much have we uh, invested the world? Mm -hmm. Less than 1%, about Remarkable. half a percent so far. Remarkable. It's only 1 trillion. So we're talking about dreams, but we're not uh, talking about practicality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, even if we want to do that, we need fossil fuel, we need mining, we need so many things, petrochemical, because you cannot build the uh, mills, the windmills, the uh, uh, PV panels without the petrochemicals. Mm -hmm. So are we making things better or are we making it worse from both ends? The uh, uh, environment mm -hmm. and the affordability of the people. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, the problem that we're facing. And the national security issues. As and well. national security issue. So uh, what uh, distinguish Aramco and Saudi Arabia, generally speaking, from the others is the long-term views. So uh, the emission, we did it because we want to be more efficient, because we have long-term concessions. And like most of the other uh, companies, we, which have very uh, short period of concessions, that's why all they care about is to dig, to get as much oil as they can without taking any consideration to the environment. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's the main difference, I would say. 
It's great. It's a, it's a really strong story. And it's also a story of entrepreneurship, which I'm going to come back to His Excellency on. You know, we've been really proud to work with Mayor Suarez um, on focusing on entrepreneurs in Miami through a partnership called 10,000 Small Businesses. We've actually worked together to invest in 1,000 very diverse entrepreneurs in the city. Thank you for your partnership. Tell us a little bit about your focus on small and medium-sized businesses and how you're trying to grow them. Well, small businesses propel the economy of this country. Um, you know, it's, uh, I talk a, a lot about the statistics of, of what we're moving in terms of AUM and, and uh, venture capital growth, but all of that is, is at some level trying to propel, propel, grow, and scale small businesses. So I think the fact that um, Goldman is mentoring, is creating microloans, I think I saw statistics that said that they're up 66% post uh, attending the program and participating in the program. Oh, that's incredible. The revenues are up. The revenues are up. Not I, to brag, 80% have created new jobs. There you go. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that's a, a major part of the equation, but I think also from a competitive landscape, when you think about where the world is and how it's evolving, and, uh, uh, you know, His Excellency gave us a, an incredible dissertation on, on, on the energy component of it. But I think there's another major, uh, in my opinion, quad-generational disruption, which is the disruption between a highly industrialized world and increasingly digital world. Right, it, it constitutes uh, the digital component of the world constitutes 2.1 trillion GDP in the U.S., which is you know approximately six percent of the U.S., and that's going to be growing. And I think that uh, provides a tremendous opportunity for the city of Miami to sort of step into that space uh, and understand how to how to capitalize on it. I call it a tsunami of opportunity, right? And I think that's been part of this metamorphosis is growing from just being known as the capital of Latin America to what I call the capital of capital. We want to be the central aggregator and deployer of capital in the world. Now, His Excellency and the Crown Prince also want to be that, and that's understandable. It's a, it's a friendly, loving co you know, between competition. Riyadh, between Riyadh and Miami, and Miami. a little competition. <laughs> and, and so, uh, but one of the things I would say about in the time I spent uh, in, in Saudi is, you know, it's, it's one of the countries where an idea, from the idea to execution uh, uh, time frame, is, is the fastest. Richard alluded to it in his monologue. Uh, we were in, I was in uh, Riyadh in October uh, announcing FIA in Miami. He calls me and he says, we're going to do this in March. I said, oh, really? March 2024? He goes, no, no, March 2023. <laughs> and I said, okay. <laughs> um, obviously, I'm all in. Uh, and we did it. Thanks I got to him that call, and his too. incredible team <laughs> and his wife and, I mean, what they've done. But, but again, it just symbolizes, you know, the, the 2030 plan. You, you see it. I remember the first time I saw it, and I was astonished. The first thing that came to mind is, we don't have a plan. <laughs> right? And the second thing that came to mind is, well, the, the scale of this is incredible. Right? So for, for the city of Miami uh, in this metamorphosis, being uh, the capital of capital means being in the center of six mega markets, New York, California, Illinois, South America, the Middle East, and Europe. And so the only thing that's missing uh, in that sort of equation is we have direct flights to Doha, we have direct flights to Dubai, we have direct flights to Tel Aviv. Is Riyadh on you your direct list? Direct flight to Riyadh. <laughs> so, not that I'm making a pitch or anything, but <laughs> but I think it's imperative. Uh, we're looking at direct flights to Tokyo, looking at direct flights to Seoul. We want to be connected to Asia, right? To make that the seventh mega market. Uh, proximity is important. Uh, connectivity is important, as Richard also alluded to it in his monologue. Uh, having these conversations in person are important. Understanding that we live in a highly decentralized world. Right, where people are working remotely more and more, which also benefits the city of Miami because you're able to attract talent and build and scale companies, even from small businesses all the way through uh, to large businesses. So that's part of the exciting future that I see for the city mm -hmm. and for the world mm -hmm. where collaboration is key mm -hmm. uh, and cooperation. And I think in my travels around the world, I've noticed uh, that all people want three things. They wanna live in peace, they want prosperity for themselves and their children, and they want their tomorrows to be better than their yesterdays. It doesn't matter what language they speak. It doesn't matter what culture they come from. Everybody wants those things. And I, I think one of the brilliances of what Jared did in his time in the administration is he focused on those common factors rather than the things that divide us as a bridge to build peace and to build prosperity throughout the world. And I think that's what we should be focused on. Instead of the 20% of things that we don't agree with, instead of constantly fighting with each other and being divided, as often happens, uh, particularly in democracies around the world, we're seeing that more and more, um, we've got to come together and, and understand the things that unite us as common people 
um, that can create prosperity for the maximum number of people. In Miami, we call that Miami for everyone. We want to make sure that our city serves everyone, from the small business owner to someone who wants to scale a large business to someone to ha that wants to have a global footprint. That's really remarkable. You know, I, I can say having worked in uh, government at the federal level, mayors actually get things done. <laughs> no, no offense to our federal officials, but it really is true because you're so focused on what the, your citizens need every single day. Yeah. You know, I remember... That's not any mayor, right? Not any mayor. Not every mayor. <laughs> A very spe special mayors. That's absolutely right. Um, well, I first actually uh, saw the very first documents around Vision 2030 in the White House uh, when, uh, with Jared. And, you know, honestly, back then people were wondering, is this an achievable thing? Is it really achievable to look at new economic opportunities to, to make very needed reforms. And while not everything has been uh, achieved quite yet, I do think you are focused on that path. FII in Riyadh in 2017 was the very first I attended there. Then you had New York, then London, now Miami. Do you want to announce the next city? No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Richard's going to kill me. <laughs> you might get some plugs um, for where to go city. next. <laughs> well, Richard is winking <laughs> for me. So I, I, I think we're going to make uh, Miami next uh, year, too, in right. 2024. So it's not going to be the year. The <laughs> so we discussed this uh, yesterday at the Board of uh, Trustees, and uh, we think, you know, with what we're seeing right now and here in um, Miami with the excitement, I, I think we should uh, uh, do more. So that's why it was decided uh, for next year too. Um, even FII, when it started uh, back in 2017, you remember, Richard, when I started talking to you, um, we wanted to make something really um, big and impactful. And we did, right? Initially, the thinking was, is this a regional thing? And the Crown Brands told me, no, this is a global, this is not about Saudi, this is about the future investment initiatives. And even if you see, I mean, of course, we'll be talking uh, about Saudi, but we're talking about the world as a whole. And uh, a lot of people didn't believe in what we can do but it became a reality. Now, um, the FII, um, as Richard said in his opening remarks, not only the uh, institute and the conference, but we have uh, the Think Lab and we have the investment arm that we're looking at certain um, things that would benefit humanity and we go there and invest in very early stage. And we've done it uh, so far. We saw the uh, report yesterday, and I think most of the things that we've done did um, extremely well. Um, what we're uh, doing in Saudi, FII, PIF, Aramco, we're trying always to measure things and to have data-driven um, processes to have more um, effective decision making because the last thing that you want to do is just to make decisions based on, I don't know, just opinions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we needed to see the data. That's why at the uh, FII Institute we did the survey and We've been hearing from the media uh, outlets, from politicians, this is what people want. But when we did the survey, we found out something totally different, mm -hmm. right? So that's the first thing that you want to do, which is surveying and doing some kind of uh, diagnostic. Then you do, again, the benchmark. Then you come to realization, what is exactly that I want to achieve, right? Yeah. And then after that, you start working on achieving these uh, targets. It's a very simple um, uh, formula. I, even it starts, um, even in, in FMB, I mean, I see Jeff in here. Um, why he opened uh, in Miami, why he's opening up in Riyadh, why he's not opening, for instance, in Paris or Rome. 
it's all about the diagnostic, about collecting the data, seeing the uh, supply, the demand, and then move on and do what, whatever he's doing. And this goes to companies like Google or Aramco or Apple. They're doing the same uh, thinking. Mm -hmm. So why corporations most of the time is outperforming governments because they're basing their decisions on data. Mm -hmm. They're not basing their decisions on what's politically correct, what is, you know, the voters or, I don't know, the media outlet would like to hear, but they base their decisions on what makes the top line and the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how that impacts so many people. Absolutely. Well, this has been such a dynamic conversation. What a great kickoff to FII Miami. Thank you so much, Mayor Suarez, for welcoming us so warmly. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, for gathering us all in about six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> You've had quite a crowd assemble, and the agenda is just remarkable. The Atias family force is pretty incredible. And I do want to thank um, Her Highness Princess Reem for being with us today. She's doing such a remarkable job in Washington representing thank the you. kingdom. Too. Thank you.